and welcome back to another, to another episode of the Real Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Jacob O'Connor. Real Conversations is a podcast for those dedicated to doing hard things and living a meaningful life. This belief is perhaps best encapsulated by a quote from the great Teddy Roosevelt. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, nor where the doer of deeds could have done them better. No, the credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena. With that being said, welcome back to another episode of Real Conversations. And today, I'm joined by the president of Wichita State University, Dr. Rick Muma. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm excited. I think this is a unique and cool opportunity because I grew up in St. Louis. I didn't know Wichita State University even existed. I know Wichita, Kansas even existed. And so to have the opportunity to sit down with the president of a, of a decently sized university and kind of share that personality and insight, because most people on campus with how busy you are and how many things are going on, they don't get to know the president of their university. So I think having this opportunity to sit down is something that's unique and exciting, and I'm excited to share it. Well, thanks for the opportunity. And we have a connection in St. Louis, too, because I used to live there and actually have family that still lives there. Yeah, I, that's one thing that I think off the bat I kind of want to delve into is how do you even become the president of a university? It's such a strange career path, and especially with yours, I'd love to start there. Yeah, it is a little bit different um, path to, to the presidency. Um, uh I started out as a physician assistant at the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, Texas, is where I went to PA school, and right at the very beginning of the HIV epidemic um, in 1985. Um, and you may not know, and listeners may not know, but in the early years of the HIV epidemic, most of the disease burden was in Texas and California and New York, and so sort of overrun with individuals with HIV, which was a great experience for me. And, and everybody in my program, but also the medical school, w was touched by this. So the PA program that I graduated from at, at UT Galveston wrote a federal grant. Um, to They wanted to develop a curriculum for PA students and medical students and nursing students. So they hired me to do it because there wasn't really anybody who had this expertise. Um, so I did that. It was about a year grant. And then there was an opening on the faculty, um, and they said, Rick, you should apply for that. Um, so I did. I got the job, um, continued to see patients uh, alongside of, uh, my teaching re requirements, which is common at health science centers, medical schools. You know, you teach in the morning, go see patients in the afternoon, or vice versa with, with your students, and you know, that's how you kind of do it. Um, did that for about 10 years, and then at a meeting – uh, a national meeting, I met the chair of the PA department at Wichita State and got to know her. They, uh, at the time, got funding from the Kansas Health Foundation to expand their program. And so they had some new faculty lines available. And so they said, Rick, you should apply for this. So I did. I had a connection to Wichita. I was born here, but I moved away when I was two. My dad worked for oil company. And that was a in the 70s, a lot of the oil companies were moving to Houston. That's where the energy corridor is for this country. And so that's where I grew up. But I came back uh, to, to the university in the summers and visited my grandparents, my aunts and uncles. My, my grandmother was a secretary in the philosophy department on campus. So I used to come up and visit her, and she'd take me around. And I used to think Cessna Stadium <laughs> is such a huge structure. And then, you know, everything's bigger when you're younger. And so anyway, I had that connection, came here, became a faculty member. Um, I got recruited to St. Louis University to be the chair of their department. That's how I ended up in St. Louis. And, and then I got recruited back to Wichita State uh, to be the chair of the PA department here. Also became the chair of the public health department in, in the College of Health Professions at Wichita State. And then just got gradually more involved in central administration and eventually became the provost, and now I'm president. I always tell individuals when they're, they're thinking about uh, careers and um, what to do and you know, not knowing exactly what to do, when a door opens for you, walk through it. There's always going to be an opportunity like that. You should take advantage of that. You can always go back through the door if you don't like it. And that's kind of what I've done my whole career, and that's how I ended up being the president. Never thought ever that I'd become a president of the university. The only thing that I really planned to do was become a PA and take care of patients. And that's been very useful for me and helping 
figure out how to support students. There's a lot of relationships between taking care of patients and students. So it's uh, just been a good uh, experience for me, and but definitely different. And I know a lot of university presidents across the country, and that's not how they <laughs> end up in that job. Definitely an untraditional route yeah, on your end. Yeah, yeah. So with those doors that you, you walk through and that you mentioned, you pick the best option you have at that time. Has there been a door in your life that you've walked through and you've started taking a couple steps and you thought to yourself, is this right? And you start kind of questioning that decision. Um, not really. Uh, I, um, you know, I, I thought about going to medical school. Um, and, and this is probably gets a little bit at your question. Uh, when, you know, when you're young, you're scared of a lot of things, you don't want to take um, a lot of risk. You sometimes don't have confidence. I think that was me when I was in high school. Um, I didn't have, uh, my father died when, when I was very young and, uh, I didn't have someone kind of guiding me, that, uh, in certain directions. Uh, certainly my sisters were uh, helpful. Um, uh, but I, I did think about going to medical school and I thought, well, I, I don't know if I, if, if that's the right direction. Um, uh, I don't regret that, um, uh, even though I feel like I could definitely have done that now looking back um, because the PA professions opened up all kinds of opportunities for me that I don't think I would have got if I would have gone that other route. Mm -hmm. Could you pull the mic forward just a little bit? Yeah, yeah you're good. You're going to cut that out? No, no, you're all good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so a lot of my listeners are around my age. I'm 22, just graduated from Wichita State, and they weren't alive during the AIDS epidemic and you were working on the forefront of that. Could you talk a little bit to the gravity of that and kind of what your work was doing? Yeah, that was uh, probably the most consequential time of my life. Um, you know, the moment I uh, walked in to that program, and you have to understand in, in the early days of the PA profession is basically see one, do one, teach one. Um, very apprentice-like uh, uh, situation. And um, first day um, when you're uh, in that program, at the time, we were turned loose in the hospital with a physician. There was like four or five students, and they said, can you go in that room and let me know what's going on with that patient? You know, I hadn't learned oh, how geez. to take a history or a physical. Or but a lot of the art behind medicine is intuition and, you know, Practicing medicine really isn't a science. There's a lot uh, that goes into the science of pharmaceuticals or d different diagnostic studies. But the, the, there is a, more of an art around trying to um, find out from a patient what's wrong with them. And, and, it, and it really is an in, intuitive process. Either you kind of have that or you don't. Um, and, and I'm not saying that those who don't have it can't do that, but it's just a little bit harder. And um, we've all been around, around health pro healthcare providers that were thinking, don't really have a connection with them. Um, and then others that, oh, well, I really connected with them. And so that's kind of what I'm getting at. Um, so anyway, uh, immediately um, I was touched by um, patients with HIV um, and uh just the complexity of that illness. We didn't even call it HIV then. We called it HTLV3, human mm. lymphotrophic, uh, lymphocytic or trophic. I'm blanking on it right now. Maybe that's why they changed the name. Yeah, <laughs> HTLV3 is, is what we were calling it then. Um, it was in 85, that same year, that it was actually identified as the cause of, of the syndrome, AIDS, uh, acquired immune deficiency syndrome. But what, what I, through all that um, education and training, I really um, felt like it set me apart from everybody else because I was at the forefront of a disease. No one really knew what the full uh, natural history of that disease was going to be as a, at the very beginning of it. And um, it, it, it just taught me... Uh, to dig deeper into what uh, individuals presented with. Um, a lot of times uh, patients would come in um, with HIV or, or they wouldn't come in with HIV or they didn't know they had HIV. They would come in with manifestations that 
they were confused about. They didn't understand what was wrong with them. And further investigation um, uh, told me in a lot of cases that it was, this was connected to their immune system, which was damaged. Um, so learning about those diseases that are manifest, uh, manifested in that kind of situation um, and uh, d- very uncommon diseases and cancers and having that experience of diagnosing those and treating those and um, uh, helping patients move forward. Now, in those days, uh, you know, individuals lived about the time they became HIV positive until uh, their demise was about seven years. Oh, so wow. everybody, everybody died. So that was also uh, a big learning experience uh, for me. It, and it just taught me um, skills about you know, how to interact with people, um, particularly people into life, young people, people who've lost all of their family support, you know, because of the, the, you know, just the whole um, tragedy around, you know, uh, gay individuals who acquired that disease and the stigma associated with that. It's very challenging, very difficult for those individuals. And, and you know, I, people always say, oh, that must have been really hard for you, uh, Rick taking care of patients like that. And I always said, yeah, it was hard, but it was much harder for those patients. So um, I I, I just learned a lot about how you deal with those uh, kind of situations that is priceless. It's, you know, people will think that, oh, well, you're taking care of terminal uh, uh, patients um, and how awful that must be. Um, But I think about the experience that I got from that, that, it is priceless, um, even though it's so horrible. I, that's what my next question was going to be is how did that unique experience lend itself to what you're doing now running the university? Well, um, I just give an example and I alluded to it just a few seconds ago about students. So actually a lot of the data that we use to, uh, you probably didn't know that we were evaluating your data when you were an undergraduate student at Wichita state, um, uh, was and how we do that um, to predict outcomes and try to use that data to improve student outcomes is based on the whole population-based approach to patient care that I learned when I was a PA and a public health practitioner. So actually, um, we uh, partner with a company called EAB that actually started their business in the healthcare industry, looking at patient outcome data and analyzing that to improve health going forward. And they use that data or that, that um, the, the process of doing that, and they translated that into this uh, academic side, the student side. So that's been really helpful for me to understand because I, I, I'm looking at, um, uh, from the population-based perspective, of improving student outcomes, retention, graduation rates, persistence rates. And I'm looking at it from a population like underrepresented minorities. I, I want to make sure that those students are successful. So I'm looking at their data from a population-based perspective and developing interventions to help move them along. That's the same thing with, with patients. So you look at all patients with hypertension who are um, uh, Native American uh, folks and what's, what's the nuances that you learn in the data about them and how can you develop interventions to move them forward? So it's the same thing, um, just a, a different uh, different group of people. I don't know that I realized that that was occurring. What kind of data did you find meaningful and what was it maybe predictive of? Well, um, we know that, that, that students, okay, you know, from your experience at Wichita State that we're really focused on applied learning. Right. I mean, you're like the quintessential example <laughs> of that. So you, you have really, um, a, as a Jabera scholar at the university, you were really immersed in all the opportunities that, that you could um, be presented with or, 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 or whatever. Um, and we know that, and we're beginning to learn more about this, that students, who, who, all students have that experience, um, they're going to more likely be successful and graduate and stay connected. So, you know, our, our institution, unlike other urban university institution is very diverse, low income students by and large, um, had a lot of needs, you know, they're working also, 
Um, they may have families, they're a little bit older um, on average. Um, and so we have a problem retaining them. Um, now, most of our students eventually will graduate. We want them all to graduate, you know, four or five or six years at the very latest. Um, but anything that we can do to keep them connected, and that's why paid applied learning experiences on the innovation campus are so important. So they don't have to go off campus to get a job to help support them to stay in school or help their families or whatever. Um, so that's been the most uh, illuminating um, part of the work that we've been focused on. And um, now there's you know about 8,000 students earning about $28 million working with the various partners on our campus and in our community. Um, that's priceless for those students because a lot of them come from backgrounds where they don't have a lot of financial resources to support their education. So uh, we're really hyper-focused on that. Um, and that's, we've learned that through our data. That applied learning has been invaluable. And to me, when I coming to campus, those words didn't mean anything to me. I know what that meant. Yeah. And I was an entrepreneurship major because that's what the scholarship dictated I had to be. Mm -hmm. And so I was grateful for the scholarship, but I was like, what am I going to do to make this meaningful? And ended up getting connected to Rob Gerlach and others at the university. And through my three years that I was at Wichita State, I got to work in all these different startups. That's a word I didn't even know existed when I came here, but majoring in entrepreneurship, I wasn't always the most interested in the academic schoolwork that I was doing. I didn't necessarily find that meaningful from an educational standpoint. Sure, it has benefits, but in terms of actual meaning, mm -hmm. helping me feel like I'm progressing towards where I want to head in life, the applied learning opportunities, I got the most fulfillment out of that because it's like, whoa, this whole new world exists. And yeah. I'm in college and I'm, I'm working in it while I'm also going to school. Mm -hmm. And that is such a unique experience that I don't think a lot of my peers at other universities got to have. Yeah. And, and that's sort of our secret sauce at the university that, you know, our, uh, our employers, people, whoever hires our graduates, they've always told us that um, it, it's so important for, for students to be connected with them because that not only helps them apply what they're learning in the classroom or learning new things, um, but helps fill you know, their talent needs um, going forward. Now, you've taken a little bit different, um, more entrepreneurial, innovation kind of focus but one of the things that is interesting about you, if we could ever do a, a case study on you, is <laughs> you also are a very highly motivated individual. And, um, and I think that just in my experience taking care of patients and then educating students, those that are internally driven, I, I see that in you. I don't know you real well, but I know of you and I see what you're doing. I'd imagine that you have a real internal drive to, to do the things that, that you do. If we could figure out how to uh, make that happen for everybody, um, sometimes it's either internally or externally driven. Um, I think being more internally driven is, is going to lead to success. Um, I think that's obviously happened with you. Um, I think in my own life, um, I've been more focused around internally doing a good job and trying to stay connected and stay on track and not go from this spot to that spot. A lot of times people are just going all over the place. Um, and uh, that internal locus of control is really important. Um, yeah, that's, that's the weird thing is each person is motivated in a different capacity. I agree that the internal motivation is the most important, but it's in my eyes, it's been like, how do you get that perspective shift? Because if people don't have something currently that they find fascinating, that's making them want to go pursue that and give their best effort, then they're not going to. And so it's like, how do you bring that awareness and have that perspective shift? And I think that comes through offering more opportunities. Yeah. Yeah. And just uh, uh, encouraging people to take risk and understanding that sometimes it's not always going to work out, but that's okay. Um, you can get back on track. Yeah, it, Wichita State, or Wichita in general, has such a fascinating entrepreneurial history between Pizza Hut and um, Spirit Aero Systems and just all of the different companies that have been started and grown here. And that risk, in my current role, I'm running an angel investment group right now in yeah. town. And um, one of the things that we always talk about is the fact that returns, if you look at like an investment, returns are often higher when there's more risk. So the higher the risk profile, the higher the returns are. That's why like a bank loan right now is probably like 7% interest rate. Yeah. But if you invest in a startup, you have a, probably a 90% chance that company is going to fail and you're going to lose all your money. Mm -hmm. But if that company hits and it's acquired or IPOs or whatever that outcome is, you're looking at a couple 
a couple hundred percent of a return on top of that. And so that's how I think I often think about it in my life too, is it really kind of sucks to fail, but yeah. you only get one shot at it yeah. in this life. And so if you want to have outsized returns, you got to take mm-hmm. some calculated, but you have to take some risk. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So one of the things I wanted to ask you is as a leader, I think it's important to be able to evaluate and to look at yourself and you've done a lot of great things on campus. But one of the questions I wanted to ask you is, as a leader, where do you think you've fallen short or where do you think you could improve? Yeah, these, this, the tough questions are coming. Um, you, know, uh, you know, part of what I think I always need uh, improvement on is making sure that we have more buy-in on campus to make sure people understand what we're doing at the university uh, one of the things that I've always found to be really helpful is to have clear priorities and that people understand and see how that will move the university forward and keep doing that. Um, you know, sometimes you get into these ruts where, oh, well, this makes perfect sense to me. Why doesn't the rest of the university understand this? Um, so having more conversations Internally, externally um, is always something that, that I know I need to do more of. Um, I just came from just from uh, the university over here uh, talking to the Fairmount College Liberal Arts and Sciences faculty and staff. Um, and we had a very good exchange, but we also had some, uh, uh, we agreed to disagree on a few <laughs> issues. Um, that's sometimes uncomfortable. Yeah. People avoid that. Uh, I, I I, t- every, I think it's human nature to tend to avoid um, things that make people uncomfortable. Um, but I, I try to focus on that as much as possible, not to be intentionally confrontational, <laughs> but to uh, make sure that I lean into difficult conversations. It, it's really important for an organization, um, for, for all of us to, you know, everybody is, has, plays a role in leading an institution from the very bottom to the top. So, but... I think if there's one thing that I could say that I wish, I I don't want to say I'm failing at it, but I, I always, it's always in the back of my mind. Okay. So what, what what is, what did I need to do more to make sure people understand um, what we're trying to do at the university? Yep. That's definitely very important. And you mentioned that, that meeting you just came from, I could think of few people that are more busy than the president of a university, especially Wichita state university. How for you, I mean, how do you think about the word balance in your life? Is that something you believe in or how do you stay on top of everything and make sure you're filling all of the buckets in your life? Um, Well, yeah, balance is difficult in this role. Um, I, uh, I, I'm a real big, um, I don't know if I should be uh, saying that I'm a proponent of it, but I'm a, I'm a compartmentalization kind of a guy. Mm -hmm. So right now I'm here with you. Um, right. I'm totally immersed in our conversation, what we're doing, and I've left everything behind, not behind totally, but I've left everything that I just came from um, to for where where it was. And, and then so I can focus on you. I, I learned that as, as as a healthcare provider. So when you go and see a patient, um, uh, like if, if I were to see you uh, uh, as a, a provider for you, um, you know, you want me to be present for you. Right. Um, and then the next person that I see in the next 15 minutes wants me to be the president as well. Um, so, and, and then you might just have a wellness check. The other person might be a terminal illness, but I, so I have to be present, uh, um, for, um, for everybody. And so I, I try to practice that. That helps me. Um, I, I think exercise is really important. Get up with my spouse every morning at four o'clock. Hate getting up at four o'clock. He's very... Uh, driven and he's raised on a farm so he's used to that love it but <laughs> he gets us up and we it when it's nice out and not too cold we we always go on a run if if it's too cold we go to the ymca and and work out there do cardio that's really important gets the blood going gets you uh, opportunity to think about stuff um and then he would say, I sleep too much. I'd say that I don't get enough sleep. But uh-huh. I try to get at least seven hours of sleep. You know, the recommendation is eight, nine hours. And most people don't sleep that much. So and, important. Yeah. And, and um, uh, so, 
that's also, uh, you know, you know, I just try to do things in moderation, my diet, drinking, and those sorts of things. I, I just think that that's just a good way to, to, to live life. Yeah. The, the, the sleep thing is vital in college. I was very much so stay up all night, get everything done, take over the world. And then I would do that for a couple of weeks and I'd be like in a really bad mood or just kind of down for a while. I'm like, why does this keep happening? Mm-hmm. And then through the podcast, I meet individuals who are sleep experts, or performance experts. And they're like, you're not sleeping enough, man. Yeah. So that's been something I've really focused on the last couple of months. And I can, t- you get much more done whenever you s- sleep more. Like yeah. that part is often overlooked. Yeah. Sleep and eat. Right. Yep. Um, or was, you know, have regular meals throughout the day and not, you know, I know a lot of people who are brilliant people who uh, who don't eat breakfast or lunch and just eat dinner and they, the rest of the time they just drink coffee. Yep. That's not that's not healthy. Uh, and you can do that when you're younger. Uh, <laughs> but when you get my age, then that becomes a problem. Yeah. So you, you kind of mentioned and alluded to getting up early and working out, but one of the taglines for the podcast is do hard things and live a meaningful life. And so I wanted to ask you, what do you do to challenge yourself and what is your hard that you choose to do in life? Well, I'll talk a little bit about um, one of the major initiatives we have going at the university, which is the Wichita Biomedical Campus. Um, uh, and I'm sure you have read about that. We're developing a health science center downtown with uh, not too far from here um, with KU uh, School of Medicine here in Wichita and their school of pharmacy and WSU Tech's uh, health programs and our college of health professions. Um, you know, we started talking about that several years ago when I came here from, um, Texas, uh, you know, I was trained in the largest health science center in the world. Um, so I graduated from the university of Texas medical branch in Galveston, but I did a lot of my clinical training at Texas medical center at Baylor college of medicine. And I got my uh, master of public health at the university of Texas health science center in Houston. That's just a, huge uh, health science center. It's the largest in the world, very densely populated with hospitals and universities. And that's what I was used to when I came here. And I, and I thought when I came here, I said, you know, why aren't we working more closely as institutions? We're all trying to do the same thing. We can, you know, leverage our resources, help improve patient outcomes, you know, work in a true interprofessional way. Um, so talking about that for several years, and, and that's a big Doing something like this is big. You know, it's it, it's not a small undertaking, particularly when two institutions are coming together with two different cultures, two different missions. Um, so, uh, and we were successful. We got the state to invest in that project. We're getting ready to break ground in, in the spring, um, and you know, it's going to be a three hundred million dollar project. And, um, so, it. it I learned through that process and just really my way of doing things is that we have to think big. And one of the things that I think sometimes in communities um, uh, that we don't think big enough and people who uh, are likely to support you, um, they want to see the big ideas. What, what's going to be transformational for our community? Um, and so um, that's one of the things that, I, that I've, not only had to push myself to go in that direction, but other people who are involved in the project to keep them on track. So, you know, there's all kinds of little details that we got to work out and, you know, IT and how we share resources and all those things and, you know, what, what color the walls are going to be and all <laughs> that. Um, those are the things that actually take something off the rails, those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. I kept reminding people that we need to keep our eye on the vision and keep moving forward. If we stop that, if we keep our, take our eye off of that, then it's not going to move forward. So that's, that's taken a lot of energy and effort, but you know, it's also very um, rewarding for me as a healthcare provider and someone who's been thinking of how we could do this in Wichita for a very long time. Um, It's been uh, something that, I've got a lot of energy from as well, even though it's taken a lot of work. 
What sort of outcomes are you guys hoping to drive for with that? Is it researching cancer? Is it another disease? Is it what is the outcome you're hoping for? Well, I think uh, initially uh, what we're trying to do is put that infrastructure together, mm-hmm. kind of like we did on the Innovation Campus mm-hmm. at Wichita State. We built the Bardo Center, which was the basic infrastructure, educational aspect with some research components to it. And then from that, you've seen what's happened. In all these other companies, almost 50 companies are either located yeah. or, or headquartered on our campus. So we're trying to recreate the same thing around health. So uh, you may know this, uh, the blueprint for regional economic growth was developed, um, I don't know, a handful of years ago, and it had several objectives. One was aerospace and, you know, uh, objectives to invest in our community, to move the community forward. Aerospace was one of those. Logistics, agriculture, um, uh, transportation, that's also logistics, and healthcare. And we pretty much... Well, oil and gas is another one. We pretty much have a plan for all of those except healthcare, um, and so this is an opportunity to do that. So, what we're trying to create is an ecosystem uh, that's focused first around the educational component and how do we get these providers t- together and think about other new programs that we could bring online, grow those areas, help feed the talent t- talent pipeline, um, but also at the same time attract. Um, big, you know, investment in biotech. Um, could, so it could be pharmaceuticals. It could be, um, uh, you know, new diagnostics. Um, when, when we've studied other communities that have done this in more recent times, um, every community that we've studied has been able to, uh, to do this, um, to actually create this uh, health science, bioscience uh, corridor. So it basically runs down from north uh, where St. Francis Hospital is, right down where you are at, where we're at today at Griever Labs, all the way down to William Street over to where the DO is school. So um, we sort of have bookended it, and, and our facility is going to be just adjacent to the DO school and where the culinary school is for WSU Tech. Um, there's already an infrastructure there. Um, and so thinking about bookending each one of those areas and then filling that in with the uh, bioscience and investment, public-private investment going forward. So that's that's kind of where we're at in our thinking. Of. One of the things I've noticed about Wichita State is how quickly things happen. Like whenever I was touring Wichita State for the first time, they mentioned the new Barton School of Business, like a $50 million business building coming in. And I was like, oh, that's never going to get done in my lifetime. And they had it in place for my senior year, and that was only three years for me. And you look what they've done on the innovation campus. You look at what they're doing now in the, the medical field. What do you think it is comparatively that allows Wichita State to move so fast and to execute where other universities maybe don't have that mobility or speed? You know, I really think it's tied to our, uh, our vision and mission. Um, we're really focused in, around making sure that we help grow our economy and, uh, you know, in, in meaningful ways. And, uh, I think everybody on the executive team, the deans are all understanding of, you know, when we have opportunities, I mean, when the door is open, you know, walk through it. Let's not think about, you know, how well should I do that? Um, should I, you know, you know how in academic institutions, the fall semester just started and then we have fall break and then we have Thanksgiving and then we have Christmas break and, Business and growth in a community doesn't fall on an academic calendar. And, and we've, we've come to realize that, that we need to be more nimble um, and flexible. Um, and, you know, it's kind of, uh, kind of like Wichita, kind of a little scrappy community, an entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, Wichita State's always been sort of connected in that way as well. Yeah, I love that. I often think about that as like Tomorrowland. It's whenever yeah. you say, oh, yeah, I'll do that tomorrow. Yeah. And then it just gets lost out there and it never actually happens. So to actually put something on the calendar and start moving it forward is just so vital for that. I call it organized procrastination is what I call it. Organized procrastination? <laughs> yeah. I think I was a victim of that during college. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's awesome. So you had mentioned uh, that you will sometimes get up or often get up at 4 a.m. and go run or work out. I love running. That's something I've kind of gotten into as of recent what sort of running are you doing? You mean uh, where or how much or uh, yeah, like distance or kind of why are you doing it or just a little bit? Yeah, so um, I haven't always been a runner. I've always exercised. I've always 
done cardio um, pretty much every day during the week. So Monday through Friday, mm -hmm. uh, it's always do something. And then maybe lay off, a, still do some uh, mild kind of cardio um, exercise on the weekends, but give myself a little bit of, of a break. I used to also um, lift weights two, three, four times a week. Wow. But that's just, it's just hard to do um, in this position. So that's why we always start in the morning because I know I can do it then. I don't know what's going to happen during the day. Um, something might come up at the university and I have to stay late or whatever. I'm tired. Um, but I, it, you're, you probably, well, I know you run very long distance. <laughs> um, um, I, at my age, you know, three or four miles at a time is pretty much what you can get from me. That is a um, solid distance though. Yeah. But it, it keeps my heart rate up and that's the whole point. I try to get my max heart rate, um, every day. Um, and, uh, you know, at my age, you know, there's, there's some things that you're not going to be able to make work right anymore. So, but I do know that, that cardiac health is important. So that's what I try to do. Yeah. I actually, this just came out and it's something that's kind of like well, I feel like it's been common sense, but there's actually been some data along it that came out today that said young adolescents that have a focus in cardiovascular health, it's shown to significantly decrease the odds of like nine different types of cancer, yeah. all of them that are pretty large odds uh, yeah. without that cardiovascular health. Yeah. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff coming out around wellness and um, uh, in that category that you're talking about that that really is pointing to the importance of, you know, eating right, exercising, staying active, you know, sleeping uh, appropriate number of hours, um, you know, even, you know, oral health and connection to heart health and, and mental health is important. So we're learning <clears throat> or we're, we're seeing now all the data that's available that's really pointing to the importance of that. One thing that I, I often find helps a lot is the recovery, which you talked about sleep and eating properly. Um, I'm a big proponent of ice baths and sauna. Have you ever tried either of those? Uh, sauna, yes, not an ice bath. I don't think I could do that. Oh, you got to try it, man. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> well, I was in, uh, it's not exactly the same thing, but I was in uh, Copenhagen uh, last summer. Um, uh, went with the business dean, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Jenin, and uh, my spouse came along and some other folks went as well. Um, we were uh, meeting with some uh, uh, industry folks over there. And, you know, it's pretty cold there uh, uh, in Denmark year yeah. round. Um, even in the middle of the summer, the, the rivers, it's really cold. Um, but what we saw every morning that uh, outside of our hotel, we were on the river, um, that people that lived there, um, they came, they were dressed like they were going to work. They came and, um, stripped down and jumped into the river and swam <laughs> some laps, just freezing. Yeah. Even in the middle of the summer, got out, dried off, got dressed, went to work. So there is something to that, I think. And, you know, the Danish are some of the most healthiest people in the world. <laughs> so they've got that figured out somehow. So it's something about that, that cold shock, that fight or flight, but it's, it's been shown to, I'm going to butcher this, but the outcome is it reduces anxiety mm -hmm. for a, a period, a couple of days. But that's significant. I mean, if you're doing that a couple of times a week, I think they say get to 11 minutes or so, it can have a large impact on your health as well as your sleep. So it's kind of all connected. So it, it gets you acclimated to that shock, and which, uh, yeah, I can see how that would. It uh, kind of resets you a little bit. Yeah. You know, you, you have all of the stress of everyday life coming at you, too many things tossed around your head, and then you get in that cold water, and the only thing that your mind can think about is your breath. It's like an automatic response, physiological response of just get air in and kind of try and yeah. warm yourself up and calm down. Well, it's like, kind of like jumping into a cold swimming pool, too, uh, mm -hmm. but probably a lot colder. Do you do, do, you do that at, at your home or yeah, in your so bathtub? I, I bought a 100-gallon livestock trough. It's like 80 bucks at Tractor Supply, and you just go and buy bags of ice, and you dump it in there. Uh, they okay. have the, the university's got like fancy five thousand dollar you know ice tubs. Yeah. Those would be great to use, but you know for a college student, it's not super practical. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, that's cool. We'll I'll have to think about that. Um, I don't know. Saunas, yes, but uh, massages, yes. I don't know about massages are great. Yeah. What do you think of the sauna? Um, I you know, you know dry sauna is that what you're talking about? Yep. Yeah. I, I I think that's good for your your skin and you know just to relax and um, I don't do that very often but I, I definitely see the benefit of it and, and you know circulation anytime you're 
uh, you know, in a situation where you're exposed to heat, that opens up your vessels and improves your blood flow. So definitely see the benefit there. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned this a little bit before, uh, but I wanted to go back to it. Looking at kind of Wichita State and the long-term vision that you have as the president, what are you hoping to drive towards in the next 10 to 20 years? Well, you know, the most important thing for us is to make sure that we meet the, the population where they are. And um, as I said before, we have uh, a growing uh, population in this community of uh, uh, unrepresented minorities, Hispanic, uh, low-income individuals. Um, If this community is going to be successful, if business and industry is going to be successful in this community, we need to make sure that they have the opportunity to go to college. And so I I would like to be able to be at a point where we have enough need-based aid um, where a student who comes to us that, you know, they have a gap in helping cover their expenses that we can fill that gap for those students. Um, to me, that's the most important thing that we can do as a public institution is help support. That's, that's the purpose, in my mind, of a public institution is to educate the citizens of their community, um, particularly Wichita State. We're an urban public research university, and there's two purposes for an institution like that, and that's to provide affordable access and help our community solve problems through research, through creative activities, service initiatives. So if we could get to um, where where we could cover that need, that means we're going to have to raise a lot more money. We're mm-hmm. working on that through ma- raising it privately and getting the state to invest in this because that only helps the state grow their economy and helps their tax base. Uh, that, that'll be a, a huge success. If I can leave that legacy um, that I, for the next president um, and future presidents, uh, I think that'll certainly pay dividends. Uh, for for years and years and years to come, it's definitely impactful. I I can say without a doubt, I would not have gone to Wichita State if it wasn't for my scholarship. Mm-hmm. And now, you know, I'm currently living here. You kind of got one stuck in the pipeline. Yeah, that's uh, great. That's the whole point. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you guys roped me in, but you did. Yeah. And I guess my curiosity lies in providing more affordable education to students is important because of the lower income students that you were talking about. How, what percentage do you think is private donation versus federal grants and working with the state? Kind of how do you actually mechanically work towards more scholarships for students? Well, it's sort of multifaceted. So um, many of our students, because of their income status, um, they, they get the Pell Grant, a uh, federal grant um, uh, that comes uh, uh, to individuals who or meet certain um, income thresholds or family income thresholds. Uh, The full Pell Grant's about $7,500, somewhere around there. Um, uh, Our full tuition is about $9,000 a year. So um, uh, so those students bring that Pell Grant. Um, We have uh, been successful in the last couple of years getting the state to invest in more need-based aid, so we're using those dollars to help fill that gap. Um, foundation dollars, private dollars are also being used for that. And then we've also allocated additional uh, dollars institutionally from our own budget towards that purpose. Um, so the most, the biggest chunk of that, obviously, if you take out the Pell Grant, that's the largest chunk, um, is our institutional dollars. So we made a decision seven, eight years ago that we, even in all the years of budget cuts that we were going to allocate towards need-based aid. So every year, at least a million dollars towards that uh, ongoing dollars. Um, And that's been really important. Um, So that's the largest part of it. And then foundation dollars is probably the the second largest. And then other pots of money that we get from the state are probably make up the rest of it. It's, it's never going to be all our, all one pot. It's going to have to be from several sources uh, of dollars that, that we use to help support students. And, and the need's tremendous, Jacob. It's just, it's, and it's growing. Um, partly because our population has become more diverse and, um, you know, the, the price of education continues to go up. We're trying to keep it low. Um, we haven't raised tuition in the last four years, save one year. I think we raised it about 1%. Um, so on average, it, we haven't raised tuition more than a half percent over the last four years. 
um, this year we had to raise it because you know, we, we had some needs that we needed to um, uh, to meet. Um, so, uh, but we're very mindful to keep that price point as low as possible. And if you look at the comparison to all of our peers of research universities in the region, we are the most affordable. Um, we're, we're trying to keep it at that. I think there's there's two components to this. The first one you're talking about is that financial assistance. The second one is the awareness of the opportunity. And I'm fully aware and thankful for the opportunities that I've been given in life and realize that they're there. How have you guys gone about reaching people that may not realize that they have the opportunity to attend Wichita State and to, to that, that could really help them move forward in life? Maybe their family hasn't traditionally gone to college and they've followed kind of a rough path. If you have one chain in that link that you can kind of straighten change, it can impact the rest of the generations. Yeah, so uh, we have a really robust recruitment effort um, out of our undergraduate admissions office, but also international um, undergraduate admissions and um, graduate admissions, but focused on the students coming out of high school. Um, we have all kinds of high school programs and students taking classes with us during high school. Um, there's federal grants that support getting students connected to the university or just the idea of going to college. So that's really robust. And um, uh, our, our team in, in the undergraduate admission office led by our AVP, uh, Bobby Gandu. I don't know if you know Bobby, but he's um, put together a great strategy for that. We have, um, again, back to data, we know where the uh, markets are, where we're likely to be successful in recruiting students. Um, whether you're um, a top performer student, a low income student, unrepresented minority, we know where those markets are and where we're likely to be successful. So we're focusing in on those areas. Um, and many of our students um, uh, hadn't thought about this, that are here now, that they hadn't thought about going to school. You know, their parents didn't go to school, so they weren't thinking about the, the importance of that. And then, you know, now there's a narrative that, you know, people think that higher education is not really um, beneficial to people. So we're, we're fighting that. So, um, you know, it's important to start very early, even at the middle school level, um, you know, getting them connected to the idea of careers. And so we're constantly bringing students to campus or going out to the high schools to that. So it's, it's multifaceted um, approach um, and telling them that, hey, I know you don't feel like you have any money, but we can put together a package here that will give the full cost of your tuition and fees covered for four years and give you an applied learning experience. So um, you can make some extra money on the side um, to help support them. A lot of people don't know that. And, and you know, it all starts with completing that FAFSA form that you probably did mm -hmm. in high school, that federal financial aid form that tells colleges what you're eligible to receive from the government, from us, and other sources. That's awesome. But mechanically, one of the questions that I have about how a college functions is you talked about you have your top performers, maybe the, the A students that are doing well in class, and you have the lower echelon, the students that maybe are getting Cs and Ds. I have found through just interviews and kind of my own experience that it's less about the grades that determine what you'll do in life and more about that motivation that we talked about and the opportunities and doors you walk through. I think I've heard previously, not Wichita State, but just in general, colleges will will judge the, the degree of success of a program, maybe the business school or different school, on what grades the students are getting. How does Wichita State evaluate how their programs are functioning towards ha helping students achieve success in life? Well, the main thing that we're looking at is retention rates, you know, people being retained from fall to fall, um, how long it takes them to graduate, uh, jobs that are available in uh, their chosen major. Um, uh, we review our programs regularly to, to determine the, whether they're relevant um, to uh, whoever hires our graduates. So we have pretty defined metrics um, that uh, lets us know how our students are progressing and where they're finding jobs. Um, if you may remember when you graduated, you completed an exit survey, and so we collected some data on you. Mm -hmm. um, you will also uh, receive uh, another survey 
like a year out, six months, year out, you may have already received it. Um, and then we repeat those regularly. Um, so we're, we're collecting a lot of information. Also, the federal government's collecting that, too. So we're looking at that data as well and see how our programs fit into that. Okay, that's good to know. You mentioned getting that survey about a year out. That reminds me, Mom, I've not forgotten. I did not get my diploma yet. I got to reach out to someone about that. Well, yeah, well, we need to make sure. <laughs> so do they not have your current address? I, I don't know what it was because I did move after graduation. But yeah. my, my mom has been asking me, she's like, hey, do you have your diploma? And I'm like, you know, I don't think I have my diploma. <laughs> So do you, the most important thing that you have, Jacob, is your transcript that says you graduated. Do you have that? I think I can still access the online <laughs> yeah, version. Yeah. <laughs> so that, I'd check that. Yeah. I'll make some calls after this. Yeah. Uh, okay. I have just a couple more things I'd like to talk about. One of them being, I came to Wichita State and I was like, oh, let's go. You know, we've got a decent basketball team historically. Talk about the March Madness run. And then I was like, I'm looking forward to going to tailgates. Mm -hmm. And man, it was a, a wide awakening when I realized we did not have a football team. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I came to learn about the history a little bit. And I think I saw from one of your posts that you recently visited the site of that. Yep. Uh, I'd love for you to spend a minute talking about that experience and the history and why Wichita State doesn't have a football team. Yeah. So um, what you're referring to, uh, Rick and I um, hiked up to the, uh, the crash site of the football team um, plane that crashed in 1970. A lot of people don't know. Um, we had football. We were one of the you know, early football programs in the country uh, had a lot of uh, record-breaking kinds of things over the years. Um, and unfortunately, there was two planes flying to Utah State um, from Wichita back in 1970 on October 2nd to um, play uh, there at Utah State. And um, one of the planes uh, crashed into the side of the Colorado uh, mountain mountainside of the Rocky Mountains, just right before the Eisenhower Tunnel. Um, I've known about that for a long time, even when I was a kid, even before I came here. You know, my family uh, was impacted by that, and n not directly, but knowing people. So it, it's a story that's been, that's been told a lot um, in, in my family. And um, I also preside over the annual memorial that we have every October 2nd. I just felt like I needed to go to that site. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we scheduled a time to uh, to go in August and uh, this this past August, um, uh, I kind of knew where it was, and Rick said, "Okay, so if, if we're going to go, are, are, you are you sure you know how to get there?" <laughs> I said, "Well, I think so. There's a YouTube video. Someone explains it. No, I, we need to be a little bit more, um, uh, you know, precise about that. So we hired a guide who actually." Um, guided us up the mountainside and took us to that is uh, overwhelming. You know, the wreckage, a lot of the wreckage is still there. Wow. You can actually see where the plane, the imprint of the, where the plane crashed and caught fire. Part of the middle, part of the plane still there, part of the wing, the, the landing gear. Um, uh, what, what was lo most um, uh, impactful for both of us was seeing pictures of some of the players 18, 19 year old. So what they look like then up there, the, their families have obviously left. That was hard to see, but it was important mm -hmm. to see for us to see what was there and what that means. And it's particularly important for me as the president who presides over a memorial to understand that. So um, that happened in 1970. You know, the, the, the program had some successes, ups and downs and um, through the seventies and, 80s and uh, was losing lots of money um and president at the time i think it was in the late 80s 86 87 decided that <clears throat> that you know the financial costs really outweighed um keeping the program open mm -hmm. um, so they closed it um and uh there's a lot of emotion attached to that decision people in this community many people would like us to bring back football we've studied it several different times to do that. Uh, it would cost between 200 and $300 million to bring football back to wow. the university. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're renovating the stadium. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I keep telling people that if a president were to bring football back to the university, it's not going to be played there. It's not a big enough footprint for what people would want to come right. see and sit in to watch a college football game. So it'd have to be somewhere else. Um, so 
and, and it's just not bringing football back and building a stadium. Um, we have to abide by Title IX rules and have equal participation among students. So, you know, you have 70, 80 players um, for football, so you're going to have to have that equal amount of female sports mm. uh, to compensate for that or to equalize that, that proportionality. So um, it, it's beyond just bringing back the football program. And there, we have socialized that with people in this community, other people, and there's just not an interest um, in bringing it back. I'm not saying that would never happen, yeah. uh, but we're not planning for, the, for that at this moment. You've mentioned 200 to 300 million dollars of expenses. Do you know what some of the bigger line items are there? I'm just curious. Well, the stadium. Yeah. Um, you yeah, know, that's 100 million dollars, 130 million dollars at least. Just crazy. Um, and you know, there's all kinds of other kinds of infrastructure, supplies, equipment that you have to buy. A practice facility is what most of these big college programs have. Um, we what we did learn through all of this is, you know, that that the people who want football back, they want a FBS style football program, which you see in the Big Twelve, you know. um, and that just makes it even more expensive because uh, mm-hmm. all of those programs have really huge, nice, expensive uh, venues. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just, and you think about it, uh, there's six to seven games played a year in those venues. It's just hard to make the finances work at this point. Yep. As we start to wrap up, I have a couple more quick questions. The first one being, this is often something I hear from Kansas State University. Wichita State is not a state. And I actually don't know the answer to this. Why are we called Wichita State? Well, uh, the university was founded as Fairmount College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. Um, I think it was just called Fairmount College. Um, We have the Fairmount College of Liberal Arts and Sciences which was a private uh, congregational liberal arts school. It was founded right there on Fairmount, 17th Street, where that church is on uh, just a couple blocks um, uh, south of that. Uh, and then the, the citizens of Wichita, um, back in 1926, um, wanted to help. The, it was a struggling private school at the time. They wanted to help keep it there and grow it, and so they... Um, uh, allowed a, a, a mill levy, essentially, to help support uh, through t- a tax base mm-hmm. in, the, in the city, and they named it Wichita University. Um, and then uh, lots of interest over time that people thought it should be a part of the state system, which KU was, and all the other schools were already a part of that that are currently in our system, KU, K-State, Pitt State, Emporia, and Fort Hay State. And uh, President Corbin at the time um, worked really hard to, to get it um, uh, moved into the state system, which was um, not uh, received well across the state. Um, he worked really hard. It's, uh, he, I think he's one of the most consequential presidents for moving us into the state system because that's when we really started to take off. And, and then we were called Wichita State University. So, yeah, I've seen all the signs at all the <laughs> sporting events. that um, I was uh, down in, at the American Athletic Conference uh, basketball tournament this past spring, and we were playing Tulane. They had a sign that says, Wichita is not a state. Um, uh, so it's funny, sort of a funny thing um, to hear. But that, that's the history. Yep. You know, we're, we're the community's flagship university, Wichita State is, and um, we have a proud history, 128-year history um, of serving this community, serving the state. So I, I, I couldn't be more proud of being the president of Wichita State University. Yeah, I know I had a great experience while I was here for sure. Dr. Muma, as we start to wrap up, I know you have your own podcast. Other than that, where can people find you online if you kind of want to mention where you're all at? Uh, well, I'm on x formerly known as twitter um, <laughs> i am on linkedin i am on threads i am on um instagram all over yeah and then youtube lots of videos out there um uh and then of course the podcast we started about a year ago and that that really is to kind of what you're doing um but to really bring to life the stories of wichita state everything from uh, our partners, our faculty, our staff, our students, mm-hmm. um, and uh, really 
focusing in on how those people have lived into our priorities. Um, it's kind of taken off. We have a new set that we just launched, uh, or we will launch uh, with the upcoming um, uh, podcast uh, this next month. So, um, yeah, it's been kind of fun um, to have the conversations with people. I hope super- you continue to do that, too, because... I, I actually, well, that's one of the things I do, and when Rick and I are on on a run, so I have a, a earbud in one ear. He has the earbud in the other, and we listen to podcasts. Nice. <laughs> we can listen to the same thing, talk about it while we're running. And, and what sorry. kind of podcast do you listen to? Um, a lot of uh, so the Washington Post has a really good po- podcast. The New York Times has a good po- podcast. I listen listen to some political mm-hmm. podcasts just to keep up to dated updated on or up to date on various different political issues. I think it's important for me and my role. Um, so just various different things, um, current event kind of things. Awesome. Well, looking back at this really cool journey you've been on, my final question for you is what advice would you offer to your 22 year old self? Well, I've kind of already mentioned that. Um, and that is when you have an opportunity like you have walk through that door, um, you can always go back through the other way if it doesn't work out, but walk through that door. That's been very helpful to me. I, I learned that behavior from one of my mentors and uh, one of my faculty members who uh, I worked with in PA school in Galveston. Um, and I think it's so important. A lot of people are afraid to do that um, and afraid what that's going to um, potentially do to them. You know, the, may not work out or, or whatever. Um, but um, if I could have any advice to anybody is to make sure that they take advantage of every opportunity that's provided them. I love it. Thank you for coming on. You're welcome. Good to see you.